All right, so we left off on isotopes. We want to take it a step further and look at average atomic mass, and then we want to consider the periodic table and why it's arranged the way it is and what it's going to be telling us. All right, so when we look at the periodic table, we realize, A, it's not simply a flat table where you just have it labeled and ordered by number. Um, number one is over here. Number two is over here. We remember that those are the atomic numbers. And then three and four are here. We've got this chunk in the middle that doesn't seem to be in the right place. And then when we look at atomic masses on our periodic table, they are not whole numbers. Now, remember that Z was equal to the um, atomic number, and the atomic number corresponds to the number of protons. And then we looked at individual atoms. We also had the mass number. Now, the mass number we symbolized with an A, mass number. And the mass number here was equal to the number of protons plus the number of neutrons. And the mass number was always a whole number. And here, the mass numbers are never on the periodic table. These are only for individual atoms. So let's see what all this means. If we consider a couple elements, so if we look at hydrogen, hydrogen is naturally occurring as hydrogen 1 and hydrogen 2, where 1 and 2 are the um, mass numbers. Carbon, for example, is naturally occurring in carbon 12 and 13. Carbon 14 is a radioactive isotope produced in the upper atmosphere. And we can continue to go on and look at which isotopes are naturally occurring. And when we say naturally occurring, it means it exists in nature. The amount at which is listed as a percent abundance, and that's this value here, and the atomic mass. The atomic mass is going to be in units of AMUs. Um, an AMU here is one twelfth of the mass of a carbon-12 atom. And it's about equal to um, the mass of one proton or one neutron. So how would we get this data? Well, we'd get this data using a mass spectrometer or a mass spec. And what you get is you take your sample, and it comes in, and you vaporize it. You turn it into ions, and you put it through a magnet. And when that happens, the magnetic field deflects the lightest ions the most, the heaviest ones the least. And so we separate out these ions by their mass, and in a sense, like a mass-to-charge ratio. And when we do that, in this case, is this is um, zirconium, we get the percent abundances, which isotopes occur naturally, uh, zirconium 90, 91, 92, 94, 96. Notice some are missing. Um, this is up, to, why it's missing is up to the physicists. We have no idea. Um, and how much of the actual abundance in nature corresponds to each of these is something we determine with mass spec. So for example, if we have chlorine, chlorine has 17 protons. It can exist in a couple of isotopes, and its average atomic mass is 35.45 AMUs per atom. Now, we know that isotopes have different masses, and what we do is, in order to actually take into account each of these isotopes, what we calculate is an average mass. Now, an average mass is found from looking at the percent abundance. Now, the fractional or percent abundance, by the way, varies as a function of where you are on the planet. Um, but nonetheless, this is what we're going to do, and we're going to say that the average atomic mass is the fraction of each isotope. Now, the fraction is going to equal the percent abundance of each isotope divided by 100 div multiplied by that mass of each isotope, and then we're going to simply add them up to get the average atomic mass for an element. So let's do an example. All right, if we have gallium-69... And we have gallium-71. And we are given the percent abundances. And we are given the mass in AMUs, atomic mass units, again, about the mass of a proton or a neutron. Let's see if we can calculate the average atomic mass of gallium. So to do this, our equation is, is that the mass, or the average mass, is going to equal the fraction of one isotope. So let's call it A, multiplied by the mass of it plus the fraction that is B, multiplied by the mass of it. And if there's three of them, we just keep going. So here we're going to get a percent abundance. Remember to go from percent to fraction, we divide by 100. So our average 
is going to equal 0 0.6011 multiplied by the mass, which is 68, 0.9256 plus the fraction that is gallium 71. And again, divide by that percent by 100. So 39.89 is the fraction multiplied by what it weighs, which is 70.9247. We're going to multiply those through and add them up. And when we multiply those through and we add them up, we're going to get 69.79. The units on this are AMUs per atom. That is the average mass of gallium, taking into account how much you actually have in terms of abundance. Note it's a little closer to gallium 69 because there's more of gallium 69. And that is going to be the number we find on the periodic table, and that's going to be the one that we're going to use for our calculations. All right, let's do another one with a bit more math. So nitrogen has an average atomic mass of 14.007 AMU. So we know that 14.007 AMU for an average nitrogen. And note this is naturally occurring with two isotopes. So that is going to equal the fraction of the first one. So let's call it nitrogen 14 multiplied by the mass of nitrogen 14, which is given. 14.0031 plus the fraction that is the second isotope. And again, you have to be given how many isotopes you have naturally occurring. And that would be nitrogen 15 multiplied by the mass of nitrogen 15, which is 15.0001 AMUs. Now, what they're asking us is what's the percent abundance of each isotope? Well, we can use what we have, which is the average, to figure that information out. How can we do that? Well, we know that the fraction of nitrogen 14 plus the fraction of nitrogen 15 is going to equal 1, because the percents would add up, have to add up to 100%. So if I take and I remove this, the term fraction and just do the 14s, otherwise I'm going to run out of space here. If I take 1, and I subtract out the fraction here of nitrogen 14, I'm going to get the fraction that is nitrogen 15. So what I can do is I can take and plug this in right over here for the fraction of nitrogen 15. So 14.007 is going to equal the fraction of nitrogen 14 times 14.0031 plus 1 minus the fraction of 14 times 15.001. And now I can figure out how much of each of these two fractions I have. So continuing, I'm going to have 14.007 is equal to how much nitrogen 14 I have. Make sure I write these numbers down. Plus 1 minus that. Three zeros, three zeros, and a 1. All right, so I can take and solve for my variable. I can take and solve for the amount that is nitrogen 14. And when I do that, or I find a fraction, I'm going to find the fraction that is nitrogen 14 is going to equal 0.9961. If I want to figure out how much is 19, nitrogen 15, I'm going to take 1 minus that. And I'm going to get the fraction of nitrogen 15 is equal to 0 0.0039. And so my two compounds or my two added isotopes here are 99.61% abundance of nitrogen 14 and 0.39% abundance of nitrogen 15. 15. So if we're given some masses, we can actually figure out our percent abundances. All right, so what have we got? Well, we have elements, and we have atomic masses for these elements. And Mendeleev, when he took a look at these atomic masses, and he started looking at how much elements weighed, and you think about hydrogen and helium and lithium, and these guys get heavier as you go on, he started to list them by atomic mass. And then what he realized was that there were more patterns involved. 
and he saw sets of properties that occurred periodically or repeatedly. And when he found those, he put those elements with the similar properties in the same column. And among other things, he used this to help predict the properties of elements that had not yet been discovered. And every now and then he found elements that were in the wrong order in terms of mass. So for example, PE weighs more than I, but they have different properties. So he put iodine below bromine because they have similar properties and he changed the order out of just a list by masses into a list by properties, which started, this is in the 1800s, by the way, started our periodic table as we know it today. This is what this looked like. So it doesn't make a whole lot of sense to us, but it makes a great deal of sense if you compare it to the properties of each of these given elements. So what he found here is if we have sodium and potassium and rubidium, these guys all have and lithium here, similar properties in terms of how they react. It's really quite brilliant putting it all together. All right, but that's not what we do now. Now we look at it like this. We take that view and expand it out such that we have columns, which are groups or families, and we have rows, which are called periods. Our rows are fairly simple. This is row one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, our groups, we tend to number as one, two, skip the 10 in the middle, and even though this says 13, go to three, four, five, six, seven, and eight. Why? Because it's a lot more useful to chemists um, than it is with, we include that center 10. So, and then within this, we have numbers of sets of properties. So let's take a look at those. All right, so first of all, we have a really big bold line through our periodic table. This separates our metals from our non-metals. So everything to the left, which by the way includes this stuff at the bottom, are metals. So if we're to the left of this, over here, we have metals. If we're to the right of that mess, we have non-metals. If we are right on that bold line and we have um, boron and silicon, and these guys right through here, these are metalloids. So let's consider some properties. Metals, metals are shiny. They have a, what we call a metallic luster. They are malleable, they're ductile. Malleable means you can hammer into sheets. Ductile means you can pull it into wires. And most importantly, they lose electrons. Nonmetals are not shiny, they're not malleable, they're not ductile, but the most important property, at least for the chemists here, is that they gain electrons. Metalloids are kind of in the middle, they're shiny, but they are not malleable or ductile, they actually shatter like glass when you drop them, and these are our semiconductors. So within that, we also have a few groups that we name. We name group one, for example, when we name group one, that are the, those are the alkali metals. Group two are the alkaline earth metals. Group um, seven, and the others have names, but we don't use them. Group seven here are the halogens. And group eight are the noble gases. Now these used to be called inert up until the 60s because we couldn't make compounds out of them, but we can make a few, and now we call them noble kind of above us and better than us. Now, with all that in mind, the stuff in the middle here between group two and group three are the transition metals. And this stuff right here that really does fit right into that spot right there are called the inner transition metals. And so we have our alkali metals or alkaline earth. We have our transition metals, we have our inner transition metals, but we have one more sort of label on this, and we label groups one through eight. And again, that would be the groups when we discuss this in terms of this one and two, and this three through eight, these are the main group elements. All right, a few labels. So 
our nice periodic table and we know how we can label this. So again, we're going to, even though this says group one, two, and this goes to 13, 14, 15, we tend to follow this pattern of this 1A and 2A here, ignoring that 18. It tells us a lot more about the electrons and how electrons are gained and lost are, is pretty much a fundamental point in chemistry. Chemistry is a study of gain and loss of electrons. 